welcome to Girls with Grafts, a burn community podcast created by Phoenix Society for Burn Survivors, a leading nonprofit dedicated to supporting the burn community. In this podcast, we'll talk with burn survivors, share resources to help with supporting and improving burn recovery, and discuss how to prevent burn injuries. Here are your hosts, burn survivors and Phoenix Society's marketing team, Amber Wilcox and Rachel Kudlak. Hello, and welcome back to Girls with Graphs. I am Rachel Kudlak. I'm one of the hosts of the podcast, and I'm joined today by my lovely co-host, Amber Wilcox. Hi there. I'm so excited to be back for another beautiful episode today, and we have an amazing guest. Um, So I'm really excited to kickstart off today's episode. But before we do, um, Rachel, do you want to introduce um, our our podcast uh, sponsor for today uh, before we kickstart everything? Yes, yes. So today's podcast is powered by the Burt Martin Foundation. The Burt Martin Foundation was established to assist those who help others and provide financial support for nonprofit organizations. We're honored to have the Burt Martin Foundation as a longstanding Phoenix Society partner. And without further ado, um, I'm really excited to introduce today's guest. Today we have on Joey Lavallee, who is a family nurse practitioner working in the outpatient clinic at the Warden Burn Center at Orlando Health in Orlando, Florida. Um, With uh, close to a decade in burn experience, Joey began his nursing career as a bedside nurse, first in orthopediatrics, and then the trauma burn step-down unit at Orlando Regional Medical Center. And that's where his passion for burns flourished. He graduated with his BSN from the University of Texas at Arlington and then completed his MSN at the University of South Florida. As a nurse practitioner, he contributed to the development of preoperative medicine clinic to improve the clinical outcomes of surgical patients. Recently, he was able to fulfill his dream of caring for burn patients again, now on an outpatient basis. He is particularly interested in the long-term care of burns and getting patients back to an active lifestyle, promoting mental and physical well-being through rehab, exercise, and physical fitness. And on top of all of that, he is an advanced burn life support instructor, which is certified by the American Burn Association. And when he's not at work, he enjoys going on adventures with his wife and two young children, CrossFit and cooking. So welcome to the podcast, Joey. Thanks for joining us. Thank you for having me. Thanks so much, Joey. So to start, um, I I know you very well. Um, To those that are watching or listening today, Joey was my burn nurse. Um, So this is a very special episode for me. But Joey, I'd love it if you share in your own words your experience of becoming a burn nurse um, and how you got involved in the field initially. So when I was first doing my um, associate's degree, which, you know, I've done or held every just about role you can from a nursing perspective at Orlando Health. I started with them in 2009 um, just to get into the hospital. So I worked in labor and delivery actually. And then in nursing school, one of my friends said, hey, our burn trauma ICU is hiring nursing assistants. You should come over. I think it would be cool. So I went over there and uh, the first couple of weeks, having to see really big burns and these big critical injuries and just being caught up in the whirlwind of them and realizing all the stuff you have to do to them. It just really piqued my interest. Um, <clears throat> we have a lot of lifers is what we call them for long-term nurses who have been there for forever. So when I finished nursing school, they didn't have a spot for me. So I did orthopedics for a couple of years and then decided that I really missed burns. So I went back, um, which has seemed to be the cycle for my career. I do burns for a little bit and then I have to go do something else. And then I inevitably come back to burns. So I did burns as a registered nurse for six, seven years or so. Um, And that's where I met Amber. And then um, when I finished my nurse practitioner degree, they asked me to help build this preoperative medicine clinic. And then a few months ago, while I was just kind of thinking about what my options were going to be and what I wanted to do as far as specializing more, I ironically got some text messages from our burn surgeons asking me, hey, would you ever be interested in coming back? And it's just like, I felt this big window open up. I mean, this was my dream job from the get go. I've wanted to do this since I got out of school. Um, I stayed teaching advanced burn life support, even though I'm in internal medicine right now. 
and two weeks is when I get to go back and hang out with Susan Smith and a whole burn crew over there. So it's going to be like a really cool homecoming. But um, I think one of the things I tell people the most, the most common thing I say about burns and why they're my hands down favorite population is they're so detail oriented. They require a lot of things to move at the same time and for you to do a lot of things right. But they're the only population that literally heals right in front of your eyes when you do it from both a physical standpoint, every time you do that dressing change to the emotional standpoint, when I've been, you know, trying to coach and talk to and use different strategies for coping and pain management and things. And you kind of watch the person develop as they go through that healing process in the hospital. Um, and then long-term, whenever I got to see you, however long ago it was a couple of years after you were done and you were following up in clinic when I was starting this new job and seeing where you were when you started the day you came in to where you were in the clinic that, you know, that far after when everything was healing up, it's just, it's, there's nothing more rewarding to me than that because it means you did it right. And you really need somebody who loves and enjoys that aspect of burn care, really in anything in medicine. If you want to be taken care of in the most uh, expert way and get the best out of your care team, you need people who love it. And I'm just one of the weird people who really love burns. I love that. And Amber, I think you're on mute. I see you're, you, you talk. <laughs> yeah. uh, the age old tale. Uh, Joey, I really love that because um, as, as your, you know, bird patient, I saw, you know, just how much you had that passion for the, the job, but for those that are listening or um, maybe watching today, uh, Joey was my burn nurse, but Joey um, is notably somebody that we remembered even years after. Um, and Joey, I think it's because of a couple of things. One, um, my husband to this day will talk about how you were a key kind of player in like my pain management, remembering like that I, during that time had, um, a lot of difficulty with like the medications I was on and just was like struggling with like, Ooh, I don't know if this pain, this pain management is like, or, or what the pain medicine I'm taking, I don't know if I need them anymore. And you kind of came into the room and were like, okay, let, like, you don't have to take them if you don't want them. And it was just something simple that you said to me that made me think like, oh, okay. Like the pain management aspect of it and your willingness to kind of work with me and what I wanted um, meant a lot in as like a nurse, um, but also um, your ability to distract me from <laughs> what was bothering me. And so we still talk about this to this day, but Joey came into the room one day and I was having a bad day, I think. And he was convincing me to, um, watch some trashy Netflix TV. And um, I started watching Tiger King for the pure fact that Joey was there and present. And so it meant a lot to me to not only have a nurse that was like listening to what I said, like my pain management, my pain was, you know, I didn't feel like I needed the medication I was on. And you kind of were like, okay, like, and listening to what I said, but then also engaging me as a nurse. And I think that's so important. Um, and to this day, really, really appreciate it, Joey. <laughs> I'm pretty sure you got you and your husband binged watched that entire series too <laughs> while you were in the hospital within like a week. <laughs> like yeah, the entire thing. Did. Every time I would come in, you'd be like, I just saw this episode. Did you see this one yet? Yes, and then we, we went, did. And that's what we, but see, that's what I liked for, you know, you have to get creative with Burns. Um, I'm a big fan, big, big fan of music therapy for, for wound care. Um, it has been proven. Um, to help reduce pain, help reduce anxiety. Um, and I used it a lot. We kind of used it informally, just like, cause look, burn dressings can be boring and you might be in there for some big ones for two or three hours and nobody wants a silent room while they're having to then think about their pain. So we used to always ask patients all the time, what, and I did it especially, what do you like to listen to? Cause what you, what Amber might like, what Rachel might like is may not be the same thing that I want to listen to. I don't listen to anything. It doesn't bother me. And you just, I tell patients all the time, if it's going to be vulgar, let me know so I can shut the door. But if that's what makes you happy, then let's turn it on. Let's use something as a distraction technique. And that's what Tiger King was. I'm pretty sure we turned the episodes on while we did your burn dressing, dressing. and other yes. things because yeah. it gives you something to look at and think about while I'm trying to, you know, maybe have to do something gruesome or painful as far as, you know, debridement or changing your dressings that otherwise you would just be sitting there in a silent room with some strange guy in a mask cap gown and everything um, that you can't even see my face. You can just see my glasses and my eyes while I'm doing something that's going to be uncomfortable. 
So there's yeah, a yeah, and it's really hard for that to like. I'm getting feedback. It, it's really hard for for me, I think, to like go into that room and realize, like, I don't know this person. I don't trust you. You're new. So you kind of would come in and and. <laughs> find a commonality I think between the two of us and then it allowed me to trust you it allowed me to say to you hey I don't think this is working for me or hey this hurts um and I think it was because you were able to find a commonality that really helped me as a patient and I know my husband seeing me more at ease because we were able to laugh and joke made me I think him also as a support person even even more relatable as well Oh, he was just, I, I remember him being, when we had to start teaching him how to do dressing changes and stuff, because we're getting ready to wrap up and go home. He was extremely nervous. Like that the whole time it was, but you can, you can see it in people is if you have a good nurse, a good, like Susan Smith is phenomenal as a patient yes. advocate and an educator. And she's like, you know, it's big shoes to step into, but I'm so happy to get to work side by side with her. But if you have a good nurse and a good advocate, that says, okay, I see where you're at now. I'm willing to hear and try anything once, but let me teach you how to do this. How do I make you more comfortable? How, how can I instill confidence in you that this isn't rocket science, it's muscle memory. So let's work on it. And then it would take a few days to teach it. But then I, you know, a lot of families can do it, but it makes a lot of families nervous. I mean, burns are a big deal. Um, you know, I get a lot of patients or a lot of people who have seen, or they ask me what I do um, you know, today when I redid my, my headshots and they looked at me and like, okay, well, where do you work? And I told them I work for burn trauma surgery. And you can just see the look in people's eyes when they're like, oh, you do burns. I could never do that. I'm like, well, I don't really have an ex explanation for you, but you know, it's, it's have to exude confidence and liking what you do. And I think your patients feed off, off of that. And, you know, you don't, especially when we have new nurses, like you may not know everything. I certainly don't know everything all the time. But if you come in confident and be honest with, I don't know, that might work, that might not work. Let's try this. Let's try that. You know, sometimes we're both learning, but, you know, I'm glad that I could instill that confidence, not only in, in you guys, but in the majority of the patients, hopefully, that I'm taking care of. Um, I'm sure there's going to be some outliers because there always are. But, yeah, that's one of the coolest parts is just to kind of see everybody really um, trust you and then roll with it. And then that's part of the healing process that we talked about earlier. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. It's what makes a great nurse though. <laughs> yeah. Definitely. I work with a lot of great nurses and that's one of the things I think that a lot of us have in common is willing to listen to the patient and be the advocate. Look, you don't want to take these narcotics and we want to try or whatever we're taking to not have to take them. Great. But you know what? If it hurts, we still have them. So let's just give it a shot, right. see what happens right. and we go from there. Yeah. And I think that's what made you so great is that you listened, right? I, I wasn't, you know, I'm like, Oh, I don't like this right now. Okay. Then let's try something new. And that was um, a big step for me of like, Oh, I have that control. And you, you mm -hmm. being able to empower me to say you do have that control. Cause I think sometimes um, it's not that you don't give it to us, but I think we don't realize it until we're empowered by a nurse to say like, Hey, it's okay if you don't want this right now. Yeah, sometimes it does come to the other end of the spectrum where I have to give them some tough love and be like, look, it's time to start weaning down off of these things. We're going to figure out methods and techniques to get you through it, but you can't go home on this amount of pain medication. And I don't want you on this amount of pain medication for the rest of your life. It's safe for me to start weaning it down now and right. us work through this together than to expect you to do it um, on your own when you go home with no assistance. Right. Definitely. And this kind of leads into some of one of the questions I, I know and topics you wanted to cover and we have for you um, was just all about, you know, overall disease prevention and health in burn survivors. So can you talk a little bit more about that? So I have um, I, I, I kind of joke around that the things that always interesting interest me the most have B or they start with the letter B. I really like burns and orthopedics. <laughs> I like bones. I like bullets and trauma. And I like I like beatus. I like diabetes a lot. Um, I was considering doing endocrinology as well, because not a lot of people like burns and not a lot of people like diabetes. But so this chronic disease management um, in the role I'm in now, I see a lot of people who both want to really control these disease processes. Such diabetes is a huge one, especially in burn population when it comes to chronic wound healing. Right. Um, the potential for infection, for graft failure, graft loss, things like that. So 
I, um, I see these diabetic patients who want to have that help. They want somebody to sit down and take the time and go, we need to fine tune your regimen, kind of the same way that I would have done that with Amber in the hospital with, with medication she's on. Um, but I'm all about promoting healthy lifestyle. One of the, there's a really brilliant nurse practitioner I got to shadow in an endocrinology office. And he said something to a patient that just kind of resonated with me. Look, I can throw as many medications as I want at you to control your diabetes. But if we don't start with diet and exercise and lifestyle change, it doesn't matter because it's not going to help. Um, so one of the things that I want to focus on when I get into the clinic and for long term care is also kind of strategies to help mitigate disease. Um, the biggest thing, hands down, is diet and exercise. And it's hard. It's going to be hard for a lot of burn patients to get back into exercise. Um, whether you've got an upper extremity burn and now you've got some webbing or some contractures in your arms, so your range of motion is different. Is it all over your trunk? So it's hard to take deep breaths. Your flexibility might not be the same. Um, but there's methods and there's ways to get people back into at least starting being physically active. Um, and that's a that's a huge foundation for, you know, for any of our chronic diseases, blood pressure, cholesterol, diabetes, you know, even five pounds of weight loss, 10 pounds of weight loss will drop your blood pressure enough to maybe get you off of medications. You get active and you lose that weight. We might be able to get you off of some diabetes medications. We might be able to reduce your insulin. You know, I'm not, I won't be able to fix everybody's chronic disease, but in healthcare, we all need to be seen as a team. So if I can help with that, that then their primary care doctor, or their endocrinologist or whoever they're seeing it also benefits them down the line as well because we're all have the same goal of trying to get that patient back to being healthier um i think one of the hardest things because i experienced this myself i was previously super active i played flag football all the time then i got into grad school and realized where some of my other priorities needed to be i just didn't have time for it so i would go work out i might go to the gym i put some equipment in my house but it's different working out alone or exercising by yourself. I'm somebody who likes to be around people. Um, I'm an introvert at heart, but in order for me, cause I like my downtime, I like my alone time, but when it comes to exercising, community is big. And that's one of the things that's most commonly touted with um, things like CrossFit that I do um, is the community there. So if you think about, and we've had several of them, within the last few years, if you think about a young active burn, a young active patient, let's say pre-burn, 30 year old male, he exercises, he might run 5Ks, he works out in the gym all the time, and then something happens and now he is a burn patient. And we've had amputees. So now think about the mental strain that that is also gonna take on somebody where I can't do those 5 this obstacle course. I don't have a prosthetic yet to be able to exercise or get back into maybe heavy weightlifting or whatever. Um, and we've got a partnership or we're working on um, getting everything approved and kind of pushing it through. But right now our organization has um, a partnership with I think five CrossFit gyms in Orlando and in central Florida through our Orlando health Institute for advanced rehab to help work with spinal cord injuries and get them back to a group exercise setting utilizing CrossFit. There's multiple tiers to it. You know, you don't have to get into knowing how to do every little thing, doing handstands, doing these heavy, crazy squats, but something is better than nothing. And physical mobility and exercise is good for you physically, mentally, um, emotionally, to conquer new fears, to, um, to reach new goals. And one of the things I'm working on expanding it to and will be is expanding it to our burn patients as well. The gym that I work out at um, actually has two coaches, Trevor, who owns it, and Steve Hicks, who's one of the kind of founding coaches that was there. Um, they're both adaptive athlete trained. So they can, work with they can work with spinal cord injuries. They work with upper extremity, lower extremity um, athletes to help get them back into being active. We have a guy that is wheelchair bound from a lower spinal cord injury who competes in like nationwide CrossFit competitions. Um, and does there's ways to make everything accessible for these patients. Um, and I think opening that door up for burns to expand on their rehab, to help them meet their goals, to help them improve their quality of life, then 
correlates into those things like diabetes control, blood pressure control, healthy lifestyle to reduce your risk of simple things like sleep apnea, but more importantly, cardiovascular disease, pulmonary disease, and things like that. So it's kind of the unique blend of what I've already been doing and how I can apply that to help benefit the burn population from a different perspective. Mm -hmm. um, that's one of the big things I want to get into and focus on um, because I'm solely going to be outpatient. Susan Smith and the rest of the crew are going to be in the hospital and then coming over to the clinic as well, but my home is going to be outpatient. And that's one of the things I want to help us expand on and just become better and more prominent in our community regarding. Well, we know the value of just support groups in general. And I think this kind of adds in that support group aspect, because I think about like after I get home, right. And uh, just being able to kind of get back to, to activity can be really, really tough. Um, and if I didn't have like Tyler there to kind of say to me, like, come on, you can, you can do it, get back up, you know, and, and, and doing that. I think just having a support person one is a big deal, but then I wanted to get back to like uh, classes and things. And I think the more that you're with other people who can support and encourage you, even if they're not a burn survivor, like I went back to yoga and started doing that. And the support and encouragement I got from, from those settings, I think was so beneficial to me because it did motivate me to want to keep going rather than just mm -hmm. like working out on my own, like you're saying. <laughs> so I do think it makes a ton of sense that like the group support, um, whether it's CrossFit or, you know, going to a workout class with other folks can be, although it can be a little scary, it does help you get back out there too, after the injury of like getting into that group setting and not being afraid to kind of put yourself back out there, which can be, like you said, very scary. So if there's mm -hmm. a, a relationship where other survivors are working out, I think that would be super helpful as well. Well, one of our coaches actually, and I don't know how, she, I, I haven't really explained uh, talk to her about it. But if this does happen, what's cool is one of our coaches that's there, she's a part-time coach, but she works out there all the time. She's actually a pediatric burn survivor. So she was a major burn injury when she was a child. Um, you can see her, you can see her scars and stuff on her legs and on her, I think her torso um, when she works out. But then that's also one of those things where imagine me bringing in a um, relatively new um, burn survivor into the CrossFit gym. And you see that right there, mm -hmm. or you see our other adaptive athletes. And there's, there's something that is calming about these are people like me. They are, they have gone through similar things. Wow. This person might be a little bit worse off than me, but look how awesome they're doing. And so it kind of sets the stage for, um, a level of comfort. And then it's the coolest thing when you're done with workouts or somebody's struggling or we're all just sucking it up together because it's 105 degrees and we're practicing, we're working out in a warehouse and everybody's always together, supporting each other, cheering each other on, giving each other tips and things like that. Um, it's just a really cool community. And the gym that I'm at is very family friendly. My three-year-old and five-year-old go with me to CrossFit and they love it. That's awesome. And they're, and the people who were there are all for it too. They give them high fives and cheer them on and all kinds of stuff. <laughs> and it's, you know, it's, it's not anything that's uptight. It can be intimate. The word CrossFit can be intimidating because there is a stigma sometimes to it. Is it dangerous? Is it this? Is it that? But we've got excellent coaches that are now certified and trained to work with these athletes to keep them safe and to identify where, what your goals are. What do you want to achieve? And let's work together to get there. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. So Joey, I do want to spend some time talking about like burn wounds specifically um, and really understanding like I think the role or the, the long term healing right that can take place some of which and I know you're saying with diabetes right diabetes does cause like a more prolonged mm -hmm. healing. Um, but burn wounds in general, they're, uh, they're so kind of gentle, right? And the, and the fact that they do have a high risk for infection would love for you to talk a little bit more about that. Um, and kind of like in terms of healing processes, right, that can take a long time. Um, you want to talk a little bit about why um, they're, they're so like fragile at that, that point and why it's important to really make sure that diet and health, especially in the beginning, is really important. Mm -hmm. Maybe exercise isn't <laughs> super available, right, at that point in the game. But, yeah. um, but why is it so important to eat healthy and to take care of yourself and to rest and do all of those things, um, especially in the burn community. Sure. So you put good in, you get good out, right? So if you are eating, and that's one of the big things and, that you may remember when somebody, we'll start with being in the hospital first. So um, 
when our patients come in, we, those burn shakes are heavy, man. And we need to fill you up with calories and good protein and they will sit on your stomach. And if you can't eat, guess what? I have a dietitian who's going to go over, this is what we're going to do for tube feeding. And I might have to put a, a feeding tube down your nose to help meet those, those caloric requirements because your metabolism is just so ramped up with these massive tissue damage injuries um, that you need an, an, a much higher amount of protein and calories to take in to not only keep up with the needs your body needs metabolically, but at the same time to fulfill the needs required for healing, for optimum healing. Um, when, they're in the, when patients are in the hospital, even if they're not a diabetic, a lot of times we're, especially for the first acute period, we're checking their blood sugar sometimes every six hours because the stress response is naturally going to increase your glucose. Um, prolonged glucose elevation, you know, AKA diabetes or similar to it, it's going to cause issues with wound healing. Um, you've got, and it also depends on the mechanism, you know, uh, grease burns are dirty burns. So it's not often that it's brand new grease that nothing's been cooked in, but if somebody had a grease fire or something exploded, chances are is they were just cooking meat or something else in it. And, uh, with the vast majority of these injuries happening in the kitchen, those grease burns, especially bonfires too, these are all dirty um, methods of injury. So we're much more concerned about the potential for infection there. And then if you add on comorbidities like diabetes or uh, peripheral artery disease and somebody who has a lower extremity injury and the potential to even get good blood flow there, we're much more heightened on our wound care and try to be as proactive as we can with it. Um, our standard for the majority of our wound care used to be um, um, SSD or silver sulfadiazine, but we now go to Xeroform and Bacitracin, or we have been for years um, to help with our wound care. So we cover you in antibiotic ointments um, and do frequent dressing changes. And if something looks infected, we switch it up to something else. And we might be doing a dressing change every four hours, every six hours with some IV antibiotics to try to get ahead of it. Because we're not gonna, we don't want to put a graft on infected skin. It's just gonna fail, and the graft's gonna get infected, and then you just end up in the snowball effect, right? Um, so mm -hmm. then, long term, <clears throat> you think about somebody who has a lot of, who had to have, who had to have a lot of grafts, let's say, on the lower extremities, and they're diabetic. Well, that graft tissue is not nearly as solid as the your um, original skin, so it's thinner. It's going, it's at higher risk for. Um, tears and cuts and scrapes and then you add on a prosthetic say somebody's got a you know above or below the knee amputation and they wear a prosthetic that's not fitting correctly and it's rubbing and you're going to have wounds and stuff there so that goes back to optimizing comorbidities like diabetes um, even in the hospital um, to help reduce the potential of those infections happening you know that's in the very beginning, that's one of the things I always mentioned. It requires a lot of these little details to pay attention to. Um, it can be difficult, it can be overwhelming, but we're an awesome burn center and I think we do it really, really well. Uh, sometimes things just don't go according to plan and somebody gets a skin infection or something because there was still some bacteria or, you know, somewhere else and it was opportunistic and we just have to treat it as it comes. Um, some of these things are really hard to predict. We do our best, but it doesn't always work out. Um, and it requires, you know, prolonged hospital stays and different rounds of antibiotics and, and some unfortunate dressing changes like Dakin's solution that are not comfortable and pleasant for people to have to go through. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it's, I think that's the most, uh, that was one of the more difficult things as a bedside nurse is when people get infected and you can usually tell and it's, it's, you'll take down the dressing and you'll smell it or you'll see that fluorescent green drainage and you're like, no, Pseudomonas just showed up. And so then you feel like you just took a couple steps backwards and it's, it sucks just as much for you guys. I mean, obviously it sucks more for you guys, but it sucks bad for us too because we really want to do the best and be the best we can for you to get through this. And sometimes it feels like you take two steps forward and one step back. Um, but you know, there's a lot of things we do, a lot of dressings that we do that are antimicrobial to help prevent those infections. We just try to stay ahead of it as much as we can. Yeah. So are uh, infections most common, you know, right when hospital hospitalization starts or do you see in the outpatient center, do you see infections coming back up or I guess how often do they, how often so, do they happen? 
Um, I haven't been outpatient in the burn clinic yet, like long-term to see these people. So I don't have a great grasp on that. My only, I guess, um, uh, my only idea of how often it happens is because what would happen is the patient would come to the burn clinic for a follow-up. And then if I was in charge or whatever, or the charge nurse, I'd get a phone call from Susan. Hey, I got an infected graph over here. I need to readmit them. Or I've got graph failure. I don't know if it was an infection or for whatever reason. So then we have to readmit you to the hospital. You might require more surgery, additional grafting, or a wound vac or something else that you can't manage. They, they can't manage outpatient, which is part of the reason why I'm there is we can avoid some of these things, right? Um, for me, they were very common um, if they weren't already red and inflamed. Which is the same time frame it's going to take for a burn to fully present its depth. You know, it may start as a second degree burn and then progresses to a third degree burn, or you know, it may start as what looks like a sunburn and then the next day all the skin peels off and now it's a second degree extensive burn that was way bigger than we thought. Um, usually within the first couple of days, we'll see if it gets infected. But then one of the other things that pops up is prolonged hospital stays. So the longer you're in the hospital, hospitals aren't clean places. Healthy people don't come to the hospital, right? <laughs> so the longer we're in the hospital, the longer we're walking around, we're touching things, we're doing physical therapy, this, that, and the other, um, the higher risk we have, especially if those wounds haven't closed, then that's the higher risk we have of them getting infected. So that's why we do as much as we can to get ahead of it early, get these things closed and healed. Because um, once it closed, the potential for infection is really low. It's when we have those open wounds, when they're really big burns, if they're weeping a lot, um, depending on the mechanism of the burn injury. So that's what we really have to pay close attention to. And if we need to get them started on antibiotics, we, we do it at the first sign if we can. Um, so yeah, it's really common, unfortunately, but it's usually related to mechanism of injury, length of hospital stay, comorbidities. Um, young, healthy burns, electrical injuries don't really, from my experience, don't tend to get infected because contact points, unless they're major external injuries, it's all internal. So I don't see a whole lot of infections in those, but your grease burns, um, your bonfires or your flame burns, those are the ones, especially if they're inside a house or inside a, a vehicle that catches on fire, those are the ones that there's a lot of things, a lot of debris in the air, a lot of dirt. Um, those are the ones that get infected the most in, in my experience. Um, clean scald burns, they usually do pretty, pretty darn well. Um, boiling water, <laughs> if it's clean boiling water, um, if it's caramel. So things like that, they don't tend to get as infected um, in my experience because they're not exposed to the same amount of germs and dirt and other debris that may have been involved in that mechanism. That's, that's interesting to note because I would have never, mm -hmm. as a survivor, not realized that there's such a thing as like a dirty burn. So that's, that's interesting. I don't um, know if, that's, uh, uh, if that is the medically appropriate way of wording no. it. Uh, <laughs> no, but... I mean, but that's if interesting. That, if you got somebody who, especially one of the biggest things we get um, is in Florida, hurricane season, right? So then we get right. wet debris from after a storm and people want to burn it and they want to use gasoline because it's wet and it won't light. So then we get these bonfire burns or we get these debris burns where there may be trash and other things in there that they're just burning it all in one pile and it's garbage or it's that's wet, water. Yeah. dewy wood. So if you just think about what is underneath that flame or is part of that, um, it's, there's just a lot involved that has the potential to be opportunistic and get that burn infected. That's fascinating. Well, I have a question for you, Joey. So I know we talked a little bit about physical activity, but um, in terms of physical activity, you know, those initial stages, like I wanna get up and get moving um, mm -hmm. maybe my burns aren't fully healed. Um, what do you, what do you recommend to your patients that, um, maybe are just getting started, right? Like getting back out there. Um, CrossFit may seem really overwhelming for them. Do you recommend, yeah, um, sure. what kind of activity do you recommend to them or, um, you know, how do you encourage them to kind of get started with just something, um, rather okay. than, you know what I mean? Like just getting back out there. What, what do you typically recommend to your patients? So I would use the same techniques that I use in the hospital and teach them the same tricks that we use for physical therapy in the hospital. Something is always better than nothing. If you sit around 
you're going to increase and you're not doing anything because you're either just not in the right mindset. It physically hurts. You're worried about things. Um, you're putting yourself at a higher risk for things like pneumonia and blood clots and, and other issues. Um, so for me, and then contractures. So if you're not, it's a use it or lose it kind of thing. If you have an upper extremity burn, that constant stretching, physical therapy loves to make people try to make their armpit touch the wall. Um, really opening those things up so that we don't end up with those contractures and those issues. Um, if somebody was to be leaving the hospital and they were at home wanting to get up and get moving around, the first thing I would do is, is depending on the, their mechanism, where, where is their burn at, their legs hurt to walk because their legs are burned and gravity is your enemy with burns because of swelling. So let's teach them how to use ACE wraps or compression wraps to, you, you do that so then blood flow and, and fluid can't pool down there. So then you don't feel like your legs are gonna pop. So then you can, you can actually tolerate walking more. Um, I, I'm always cautious with telling them, don't go outside for a super long period of time. A, it's burned, so we wanna keep them covered. But B, if you still have areas that are healing, I really don't want you sweating too, too much around it and being outside and in the dirt. Cause like we said, that's going to put us at a higher risk for infection long-term. Um, I want people to be independent. So find the little things around your house that you couldn't do that you can work up to doing. Can I sweep and mop? Um, can I go to the grocery store and walk the whole grocery store, but and not sit in the electric scooter? Um, can I, I wouldn't go out and mow the yard or anything. Um, but you know, can I do those things around the house? Do I have stairs in my house? Can I go up and down the stairs? And I did my stairs five times today, but my bedroom's on the first floor, but like my house, can I go up and down the stairs five or six times today? Tomorrow, I want to do 10. Find something where you're at and then gradually increase it. Um, when, when we do preoperative risk stratification now, we use a tool called the Duke Activity Status Index, which is what we use to gauge somebody's metabolic equivalence or what level of stress they're putting their heart under because say I'm seeing somebody now it's not outside of being burn related that needs a hip replacement and typically people would just go can you walk a block on level ground well no I got a bad hip can you walk up a flight of stairs no I got a bad hip so this expands it of can you do things like sweeping mopping can you do the dishes can you do yard work can you swim can you get on a bicycle can you play football are you sexually active you know there's a lot of things you can do to get your heart moving that don't require um, a gym, that don't require you to be extremely physically active, that have benefit. And then once, you know, maybe walking the grocery store is exhausting. You can only do it for 10 minutes. Okay, the next time you go, let's try doing an extra, another 10 minutes. Let's do a couple more aisles. And then you gradually work up to that to where you get to the point to where you're like, I think I've done everything I can do on my own. And now maybe something like getting back into a gym mm -hmm. or CrossFit or something like that now feels more appealing because you've just earned the confidence out on your own or maybe with a spouse or a family that you've met goals that you set, you are getting back into moving and getting physically active. You don't have to go run a 5K. You can go walk around the block. You can take your dog for a walk. You can check the mail. Any increase in intensity or distance with, with each attempt is a win. And so I try to make sure that people understand that, you know, get up and walk to the door the first time of physical therapy when you're in the hospital. Now we're going to go down the hall. Now we're going to do two laps. It's the same concept that we did in the hospital, but I want you to get back to feeling independent at home. Can you cook your own meals? Can you do your own laundry? Can you do things by yourself so you don't feel depressed because you're physically dependent on everybody else? So just do basic activities of daily life. Mm -hmm. I love that. Yeah, it sounds like the more important thing when instead of say maybe exercising or physical activity even is just movement, like the simple yeah. things of doing the dishes or doing the laundry, just moving your body sounds like the most important thing um, yep. versus like when people even I do the same thing. Like when I think of exercise, I'm like, oh, I have to be breaking a sweat and like my heart rate has to be up and I want to be burning those calories. But you know, for a newly injured survivor, it's, it's about that movement. They may not be able to do that. They may not be able to get their heart rate up to get it to quote unquote aerobic exercise levels, you know, which is high for a lot of people, especially younger people. Um, so they may not be able to get there, but there's something psychological about those little wins. Um, because you know, I couldn't tell you the amount of people that I'm like, okay, so what do you do every day? I don't really do anything. I go from my bed, I sit in my recliner that then props me up so I can get out of it. 
and they don't do anything at all. They have people who come over and clean the house and prep their meals and this, that, and the other. Um, and I don't want patients to feel like their their only resort is to get to that point. Um, so it's those tiny little things that then evoke little wins and then they evoke confidence and then it just kind of, it, it snowballs and it builds up so that six months from their injury, they, I want them to be miles ahead, hopefully, than where they were at that point in time. I'll never forget my husband and I were kind of get, getting back to, to the house and Cindy, who's an, um, on your team um, in terms of uh, kind of physical therapy, Joey at Orlando Health, we walked in and, you know, she could see I was walking funny and my husband said to her, well, I'm, I'm doing everything. I'm like, you know, I'm, I'm trying to help her and, and let her rest. And she said, said to him, like, no, if she needs a drink, she needs to get up and go get it herself. Or if she needs like a snack, let make her go do it herself. Cause it was yeah. those little things like I, because I wasn't moving, I wasn't trying to move and it was making things worse because I wasn't walking correctly and stuff. So, um, yeah. it was with that like tough love that she told him, like, you have to kind of give her tough love and like, it hurts, but she can get up and do it herself. It was, that's how I kind of started was like doing that tough love, um, mm -hmm. and getting back to it because I needed it for my own well being And that confidence I built from like going to do those things is what then pushed me to continue to do more. But if I wasn't moving it, I, I wasn't really getting better. <laughs> no, it's very cliche. It's use it or lose it, you know, and sometimes you need people to give you that tough love. And you know, you've got like your husband, for example, he sees you hurting. He sees you in pain from this injury. He wants to do what he can do to take care of you. And sometimes the best thing you can do to help somebody take care of themselves is promote them to be independent and to give them some of that tough love. Because if you didn't do any of that in the hospital, you weren't going to do it when you got home. So we have to start somewhere. Right. Yeah. And what's the balance between, you know, we're talking... And I think the more common thing is not doing enough movement and not pushing yourself enough, but what's the balance then of over pushing yourself or like, how do you know when you've, you shouldn't keep going, you shouldn't keep pushing yourself forward? Um, the basic comes down to let pain be your guide. Okay. So uh, if there's a difference between being uncomfortable and being injured, you know, my coaches, my dad used to ask me all the time, are you hurt or are you injured? Um, <clears throat> so we, you know, sometimes you do have to push through some things, but stubbornness also can lead to injury. So um, we, you want to gradually work things up. You know, sometimes there's just injuries you just can't avoid. Um, but <clears throat> knowing your own, you have to be self-aware of your own body, knowing your own physical limitations. Um, going from being in the hospital one week to with upper extremity burns and you're really tight to then trying to go and hang from a pull-up bar or do like get back into CrossFit immediately is you got to work your way up there. You're going to run the risk of tearing things. Um, I've seen some, I've seen some axillary wedging before just tear with too much range of motion. Sometimes you can't avoid that. Um, but some people are just hyper-focused on getting back or getting to a next step that they're ignoring the discomfort they're in. Mm -hmm. Um, and pushing themselves a little bit too far. You know, it can be a good thing to push through some pain, but you have to be aware of your own body. Um, and if it hurts too much, okay, let's dial it back enough to where I want to feel it. That's, that's how I approach exercise in general. I want to feel it a little bit, but I don't want to injure myself. I don't want to mm -hmm. now, I just did this, but now I'm down for a week and I just set myself back. So letting pain be your guide to being self-aware, read your own body, know what hurts. Are you feeling a little bit extra sore here or there today? Okay, well, let's, let's, let's rest that part and try something else instead. That's not going to physically strain me too much. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And what advice or, you know, tips do you have for adaptive athletes who maybe have an amputee and have a prosthetic then? Um, you know, I guess just for them to, I mean, maybe they're fully healed, but they're still learning how to use their prosthetic and they want to get back mm -hmm. into working out. But what advice do you have for them? Um, I really think there are so many great um, examples and role models, I guess, for adaptive athletes with how big social media is in our culture now. If they haven't already... I want to introduce you to a few of them online. Let's show you what possibilities are. Let's show you that it is possible. 
you may not get, this is, this is a top tier athlete kind of thing, but if you're worried and concerned about either what people are going to think, what is physically possible, what's not physically possible, um, showing by example, um, and then getting people around them, such as our adaptive uh, trainers, um, to really work with them one-on-one. -on -one. Um, we have a group, we use ABC Brace and Prosthetics um, for Orlando Health. Their, their owner, Scott, is a phenomenal guy, and they run an amputee support group called Limitless, L-I-M-B, but limitless. And so they have a support group for that. They go out and do activities. He comes in. If I have somebody who's a new traumatic amputation, I'll call them or text them and say, Hey man, um, can you send somebody by or talk? They're really interested in this support group when they get out of the hospital and he'll come by and drop off information while he's there. Then he can provide long-term conversations that I just don't know enough about. Okay. When are you capable of getting fit for a prosthetic? What does that process entail? How often does it need to be refitted? Are there different types for different activity levels? And so just getting more resources around for those patients so that they're not going down rabbit holes on the internet and may not be getting the best information. Um, that's usually what I would start with. And then showing them by example, these are the things that are possible. What are your goals? What do you want to do? Um, and then let me help you find, surround yourself with the people to help you meet them. Cause it may not be me. I'm not good at everything, but I know a lot of people too that might be able to help us get there that I'm just not able to do on my own. Mm -hmm. Joe, I want to switch gears a little bit and focus on, um, we have a lot of nurses that listen to the podcast. So mm -hmm. um, you have been in the field for quite some time, especially with burns in and out. Um, obviously there may have been some challenges, even just as a new nurse, like getting started. Um, what advice would you give to someone who's new or, or what challenges did you overcome as a nurse in the burn field that you're like, gosh, I wish I knew back then. I, the biggest advice I can give for especially new nurses, regardless of the field. Um, I think I've trained hundreds probably of new nurses as a preceptor, listen to, listen to people. We do things called, um, uh, when our, when our team does rounds, I always encourage the nurses, especially the new ones, go sit with the physicians, listen to them, ask questions, be inquisitive. If you're interested in something, go look it up because there's abundance of evidence out there. If you're really interested in it, go look it up. And then it comes to this. So that's just the, the confidence in what you know aspect. The hardest thing for a burn nurse is getting over the fact that you are causing pain to cause healing. So you have to be aware that, you know, <clears throat> there's tips and tricks tricks to things. I remember one nurse that I looked at him and I'm like, Hey man, you know, we've only got a certain lifespan for that pain medication to work. So you got this narrow window where you have to get as much as you can done in a short amount of time. This might hurt a 10 out of 10 pain right now, but if you can do it in five minutes versus 30 minutes, they're in that same level of pain for five minutes, not 30 minutes. Um, you, you, you're going to make people uncomfortable, but after to breathe that you have to get that collagen off. You have to do it in a way that is smooth and efficient and it takes muscle memory and sometimes it takes you overcoming some of your own personal hurdles of I don't want to hurt this person well they kind of need you to and it sucks and that's part of the tough love thing they kind of need you to do it if you want them to get better this is what needs to get done and that'll tell you whether or not a person's meant to do burns or not if they physically can't do it they may need to find something else and that is perfectly fine burns are not meant for everybody but it's better to learn that early on than to figure it out five years down the road when you've been personally struggling with what you've done and maybe your patients haven't benefited from it. Um, I'm lucky enough that the team that we have between Susan Smith and all of our burn surgeons, they love to teach and they will answer any question you have. And if they don't know, they will look it up with you. Um, so using your resources, know those around you that can help teach you what you need to know and how to get better at it. Because we've all, we all have our own little tips and tricks on how to get through burn dressings, how to do this wrap so it doesn't fall off. Why does this one keep sliding down their arm? Why does this happen? Why does that happen? Use your mentors. Use the people around you. Because most we all want you to be successful. You're part of our team. And that's how, that's how you know if you're part of a good team is when you've got those kind of charge nurses and mentors that are willing to take you under their wing and make you better. So trust everybody around you because they want you to succeed just as much as you do. I love that because I think Tyler, my husband learned that from the nurses as well of in terms of like, oh, 
we can do this long, right? And and it can be um, take a long time, but we can also do it in a quick way and get through it faster and be done. And like, it's going to hurt. And I know that it's going to hurt, but um, a lot of like, sometimes he did have to write, like wipe something clean and it wasn't pain. It wasn't feeling great, but knowing like as a caregiver, he had to know, like, I have to do this or it's going to suck later. So um, there was a lot that we learned, I think just from the nurses in general of like, we can either do this quick and, and have it be done, or it can take a long time and we can take our time, but it's not going to feel great either way. So let's just get it done quickly. Yeah. Um, but also learning like he didn't have a choice. He had to do this for my well being, And I had to, as a burn patient had to understand, okay, like it hurts and you're not, you're not meaning to hurt me. But if, if you don't do this, I may suffer the consequences in the long yeah. run. And I think that's, that was a helpful <laughs> lesson for him to learn as well. And we're not being malicious. Trust me, I understand it is not fun. I have never been in your shoes. I burned the tip of my thumb or something, you know? So I couldn't imagine being in that position. But you have to know you're not being malicious. This is just a necessary evil that has to happen to get you where we need you to be. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Well, I know we're coming up on our time here. So before we enter our final questions, Joe, I did want to ask you one more question. Um, what is your, you know, pro tip as a burn nurse for a caregiver? What advice would you want, you know, caregivers, loved ones to know, you know, as they're caring for that survivor in their life? And maybe it's something about dressing changes or lotions or whatever you yeah. swear by. <laughs> for like the patient's, the patient's family when they take them home or. Yes. Yeah. Um, my pro tip for the paint for the, what I always did is it's, and it's so simple because everybody always says it, um, for a variety of things of, I'm going to, I'm going to teach you, show you, you're going to do it. So I'm always, I'm one of those. And especially if this is any nurses listening, I don't know how to get them to do this. You know, you learn most people, especially in dressing changes, they learn hands down with hands-on experience. You know, we try to use whatever tricks we can use. We, sometimes we don't have family that can be there for dressing changes. So we would video record them and send them to the family. This is how you do it. Get families involved and listen. If they don't feel comfortable doing something, try to adjust it to make them comfortable. Find a new way to do it so that you can make them comfortable doing it. One of the trickiest things in the world to wrap up when you go home, as far as burn dressings are concerned, is a hand. Everybody always gets nervous wrapping hands and fingers. And how do I do it so it doesn't fall off? How do I do it so it's, it's, um, it, it actually works and it stays where it's supposed to? So early and often education for families makes them feel comfortable. Um, what I used to do is if, you, if both your hands are burned, I wrap the left hand, you're going to wrap the right hand. And I'm going to walk you through it. And we're going to do that every day. I will, what time are you going to be here? Listen to your patient. Hey, I got to work, but I don't get off work till three o'clock. I guess we're doing your dressing change at three o'clock in the afternoon so that your loved one, your family member can be there to be a part of this experience because we want them to feel included. If you can teach them, then you're going to instill confidence in that family member who's then going to instill confidence in the care they're going to receive at home and everybody wins. And then you don't have them calling you back at the nurse's station a day later trying to figure out how to do something because you took the time to do it right the first time. Mm-hmm. I love that advice. Mm -hmm. I think it was also helpful to my husband learned from you, Joey, of like, just, I know Tiger King was such a silly thing, but, um, putting something on to distract me during that time, we came home and that's exactly what we did. Like we had a room and we would put TV on and it didn't, it had to be something that I wanted to watch. And I could only watch Mm -hmm. that television or whatever it was during that time. So that I would like look forward to doing that dressing change because I had that distraction in front of me. And I think we learned that from um, the nurses and, and folks like you at Orlando health of like distractions are okay to be able to, to gather that mm-hmm. um, moving forward. And it was such a powerful tool that you taught us for sure. Okay. Well um, we're coming up on time. So um, we always ask our um, guests. And so for season three, um, my biggest, uh, or our, my, my number one question that I ask is what advice now, I know we've asked about nurses and caregivers, but, um, what advice do you have for a survivor, um, like me that's, you know, leaving the hospital, um, for the first time, um, hasn't even seen you in the clinic yet, but, um, what advice would you give them as they leave the hospital? 
you know, you're so used to having somebody here 24 seven, but I would want them to know and to feel confident. We have done everything in our power to set you up for success. You are stronger than you seem and your family or whoever is with you. We've taught them and they know what they're doing. Just because you're walking out of the hospital doesn't mean you're not able to, you're, you're losing out on the care that you would receive. We're not just abandoning you, putting you out on the street and saying, good luck. There is a huge team of people both here and in the clinic, whether it's in phone or on person who are here to support you. You are not doing this alone. And um, depending on, you know, they may have been in the hospital for a long time. You're used to us doing everything for you, but you would be surprised at how well you do when you're kind of required to get back to normal life. This is the goal we've been working for. And, it's, you know, it's all downhill hill from here. Awesome. Well, and with that, our, our final question, it's our Phoenix Partner question, which today is sponsored by the Burt Martin Foundation, an organization dedicated to assisting nonprofits and the communities they serve. So the question is, what is something you are grateful for today? It doesn't have to be burn related, doesn't have to be healthcare related, can be anything. Um, I am grateful for an awesome support structure just around me personally. Um, you know, there's been a lot of things that have come up. I've struggled wondering what was going to happen when I got out of grad school. I've had excellent support getting through all of that with my wife who somehow keeps everything level headed. Um, and then she just kind of keeps pushing forward and helping me learn patience and teaching me patience. And I think that that's one of the big reasons why I was able to have the opportunity that I have now to get back to Burns. I think that for me personally, knowing and having somebody you can be completely unfiltered and honest with, um, whether it's from just a professional standpoint, a personal standpoint, it could be a spouse, it could be a best friend. If you have that person, regardless of what comes up in your life, it may be a burn injury. It may be, you know, the worst thing you want to get is that phone call um, at any time of day saying somebody's in the hospital. You have that person there to help keep you grounded and to bounce things off of and to just keep you level headed. Without that, I would have lost my mind a bunch of times between grad school, between having a three year old and a five year old and having two kids while I'm in school. You know, I'm thankful to have the support structure that I have. And I don't think that enough people del uh, deliberately try to find that. Um, so I, I can't do this on my own. And I don't think any of us really can regardless of what's going on in our lives. So that's the big thing for me. That's what I'm thankful for. Well, Joey, wow. we Joey, so sure. appreciate you being here today and um, want to congratulate you on your position with Orlando Health. Um, I myself am excited to come in and visit sometime and see you in the clinic. But um, on behalf of Phoenix Society, we want to thank you for joining us today. We really appreciate it. It was fun. Thank you for having me. Yeah, Thanks thank so much. you so much. Bye-bye. Thanks so much for tuning in to this episode of Girls with Crafts. If you are enjoying this content, please feel free to rate, subscribe, and leave a review wherever you listen to your podcasts. This helps others find the show, and we greatly appreciate it. Thanks again for listening, and we'll catch you in the next episode.